<laughs> well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Jim Tubbs, uh, Chair of the Religious Studies Department here at the University of Detroit Mercy, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this, the eighth in our series of the Ralph and Barbara Cushing Distinguished Lectures in Religious Studies. Uh, these annual lectures focus in a rotational pattern on three major aspects of religious studies in three named lectures. Uh, tonight's Jane D. Shaver Memorial Lecture in Scripture Studies, and then next year the Justin Kelly S.J. Lecture in Theology and Spirituality, and the year after that the George Pickering Memorial Lecture in Ethics. Uh, after tonight's presentation, you are all invited to a reception, which will be held back in the back of this room. Um, also, uh, there will be available several sheets, um, sort of sign-up sheets up here in the front, um, in which you're invited to sign and provide your email address if you would like to receive notification of um, pushing lectures in the future. Um, events like this always uh, involve the input of numerous people, and we are grateful for a number of those who have helped make tonight's lecture possible, uh, including Michael Jason and his crew, who are providing uh, tonight's um, audio system, uh, Dr. Mark Denham, uh, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Education, and our college's uh, development officer, Terry Carroll. Uh, and of course, uh, our greatest thanks go to Dr. Barbara Cushing and the late Dr. Ralph Cushing, whose gifts and bequests have made possible uh, this entire annual lecture, lecture series. Ralph and Barbara are both alumni of our Master of Arts in Religious Studies program, and they have been the most thoughtful, supportive, and generous alumni that any program could ever hope for. So, Barbara, thank you so very much. Well, now without further ado, to introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening, Dr. Emerson Powery, I will call upon our Religious Studies Department's own resident scripture scholar, Dr. Todd Hibbert. Well, good evening. Good evening. I join Professor Tubbs in welcoming you tonight. We're glad that you've chosen to be with us what promises to be an interesting and informative uh, presentation. It is my great pleasure to welcome to our campus for the 2015 Cushing Distinguished Lecture Series, Jane D. Shaver Lecture in Scripture Studies, how's that for a title? Uh, professor Emerson Powery. Dr. Powery is Professor of Biblical Studies at Messiah College in Grantham, Pennsylvania. He earned his PhD in New Testament and Christian Origins at Duke University and his Master of Divinity at Princeton Theological Seminary. Much of his research centers on empire, power, identity, and spirit in the Gospel of Mark, as well as the function of the Bible in the 19th century slave narrative tradition from which tonight's talk derives. He is the recipient of several grants and fellowships for his research. He is also a past president of the Southeast region of the Society of Biblical Literature, and has served on the editorial board for the Common English Bible, for which he also produced the translation of the Gospel of Mark. He's also a recent member of the editorial board for the Journal of Biblical Literature, which is the flagship journal of the Society of Biblical Literature. Professor Powery's publications include Jesus Reads Scripture, published by Brill in 2003, True to Our Native Land, an African American New Testament commentary, published by Fortress in 2007, and several articles in journals and essay of collections. His newest book, I have to confess, I don't really know the Genesis of Liberation. That's what I've ever done. The Genesis of Liberation uh, is a study of the use of scripture in slave narratives, including those of Harriet Jacobs and Frederick Douglass. It will appear later this year, uh, also from Fortress Press. Dr. Powery is a native New Yorker uh, who also spent part of his childhood in Miami, so he is no stranger to urban settings such as ours. He's married to Kimberly, and they have four terrific sons. On a personal note, Emerson and I first crossed paths as undergraduates in the same institution over 25 years ago. It seems hard to believe it's been that long. He looks much older than I am. <laughs> After graduation, we both went our separate ways, he eventually to Duke, I to Notre Dame, 
but our paths were destined to come together again about 15 years ago when we ended up teaching in that same academic institution. During our time together there, he proved to be a fantastic colleague and eventually department chair. He was also a wonderful advocate and sounding board during some very challenging times, the very model of professional collegiality. However, most importantly, he has become over the years a very dear and close friend. We have spent time in each other's homes, on the softball diamond together, and yes, at the poker table together. That's a different story you can ask me about later. Our kids have laughed and played and our wives have shared academic husbands. Though we have both gone on to other academic appointments, which means we don't see each other as often as we once did, and I do miss our monthly poker game. Uh, it is good to know that whether we are texting back and forth about baseball, his Mets, my Tigers, sharing updates about our kids, or making plans to share dinner at the next conference, we can pick up right where we left off, as if no time has passed. I am delighted to have Professor Powery here on our campus for this important talk. Please join me in welcoming. dinner and that was a nice time and I want to thank those who invited me. Thank you Jim for getting me to where I need to be on time, <laughs> picking me up at the airport. And um, Todd is not only a good colleague and friend and a scholar of the prophets, well known in the Society of Literature and Larger Academy, he's also an excellent Texas Hold'em player. So. <laughs> Peculiar to slavery in the Americas, was the phenomenon of race. Even as arguments in support of the peculiar institution mounted, the notion of ethnic groups was less systematically explored within religious circles. Nevertheless, enslavement of people of African descent sustained the practice in the United States. Many began to turn to the Bible to buttress their cultural perspectives on race even as they utilized the holy book to justify the tradition of holding other humans in bondage. Interpreters highlighted a number of passages to defend differences among people groups, but the predominant support text for debates surrounding racial divisions was a passage from the book of Genesis. Following the end of the flood in the Genesis account, the narrator introduces Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah plants a vineyard as a sign of the future productivity of the land. From the vine, he gets drunk and falls asleep. Ham witnesses his father's nakedness, the implied sin of the story. When he awakes from his stupor, Noah announces a curse on Canaan, Ham's son, including the indictment that he would be his brother's servant. Within ancient Israel, the story functioned as an ideological account for the downfall of Canaan, which in turn provided justification for Israel's eventual entry and destruction of the land of Canaan. Yet, in the 19th century, this story became one of the most popular myths promulgated for the purpose of shaping popular perceptions among religious people and develop, developing the ideology necessary for maintaining the peculiar social institution. The so-called Curse of Ham tradition was widely appropriated as a biblical warrant to maintain the link between race and the prevailing slaveocracy. For example, the popular white writer, Josiah Priest, very popular, suggested that the character of Ham was like the color of Ham's implied black skin. In response to such views, African-American authors would occasionally refute Genesis 9's implications for coloration, especially with respect to the ties between blackness and enslavement. Since the biblical narrative omits racial designation, African-American interpreters responded to conjectures of coloration in Genesis 9. Rarely, however, was the passage utilized by the formerly enslaved to discuss the origins of whiteness. Rather than a discussion of the image of blackness in the white mind, on which much has been written over the last two decades, we want to explore the image of whiteness in the black mind. Fundamental to this historical discussion is the broader notion of identity and the appropriation of the biblical tradition. For 19th century African Americans, 
as historian Sylvester Johnson has shown, this also meant constructing a Negro past, that is, racialized history, where there was previously none. Africans were not Africans or Negroes before the emergence of whiteness and colonization. More specifically this evening, what I'd like to do is take up the discussion from the perspective of the earliest collection of the African American literary, literary tradition, the narratives of the formerly enslaved, what many people call slave narratives. The 19th century freedom narratives, I call them freedom narratives because none had been written before someone was free, someone had escaped and then started to write the narrative. So from those narratives, we have various challenges to the curse of Ham Min. One, they observe contemporary experience and the phenomenon of black skin in the Americas. Two, they employed the one blood tradition, used another a counter text from Acts 17 as a counter story. And occasionally, three, they approach less common biblical passages in order to explore alternative origins. Within the literary tradition, this third challenge stands out. William Anderson's 1857 account of Second Kings, a passage he claimed as support for the origins of whiteness, comes to the forefront. After an analysis of the curse of Ham in representative freedom narratives this evening, what I'd like to do is to situate Anderson's interpretation of Second Kings within the broader ideological context of the period. And then I'll conclude with just a brief summary talking about some suggestive uh, hermeneutical implications, what are the implications of reading the text this way? What does this tell us about not just African American readings, but the way people tend to read the Bible? So one of the things I won't say at the end, I'll say right up front, is the Bible can't speak for itself. The Bible must be interpreted. It doesn't just speak. As popular as the Curse of Ham passage was for uh, in the public discourse of the 19th century, it failed to attract the same kind of attention within the antebellum freedom narrative tradition. Frederick Douglass was the first among the formerly enslaved to include it within his narrative. In the 1845 account, Ham appeared in the opening pages, page six, as his first allusion to the Bible. In the context of Douglass's description of the increasing mulatto slave population, he referenced the tradition of the curse of Ham from Genesis and the ideological racist theory associated with this myth, common during the antebellum period. For many whites, this curse justified the enslavement of African people, since most Americans considered people of African descent to be descendants of Ham. Here, they're following all kinds of theories that are circulating. I'll just give you one. This is, again, Josiah Priest, a very popular writer, who in his pamphlet called Slavery as it Relates to the Negro, published in 1843, he writes these words. Those two sons were Japhat and Ham. Japhat, God, caused to be born white, differing from the color of his parents, while he caused Ham to be born black, a color still farther removed from the red hue of his parents than was white. Events and products wholly contrary to nature in the particular of animal generation as relates to the human race. That's Josiah Priest. Indeed, for Priest and others, Genesis 9 was the anchor text for more than slavery. He believed that the original human being was red, so he explained the miraculous intervention as a second creative moment and Ham's black skin, as random as it was, as an act of the divine. In a slightly different direction, many Southern ministers propagated the idea that the curse of Canaan, sometimes called curse of Ham, sometimes called curse of Canaan, the curse of Canaan was a curse of blackness, as well as enslavement. So Vesta Johnson, contemporary historian, forcefully argues that the primary concern surrounding the myth of Ham tradition was racial origins and not slavery apologetics, as many assume. The fundamental issue, he argues, was not slavery, but identity and existence. In popular white imagination, I would add, the two issues, uh, racial origins and slavery ap apologetics, those two issues were not easy to distinguish from one another. Many 19th century blacks, nonetheless, accepted him as the progenitor of the descendants of Africa, even while questioning the language of perpetual oppression. Frederick Douglass acknowledged the impact of his contemporary experience on any kind of interpretation of the biblical text. In Douglass's words, someone had predicted the downfall of slavery by the inevitable laws of population. For Douglass, this population shift, that is, the rising numbers of mulattoes, at least will do away the force of the argument that God had cursed Ham and therefore American slavery is right. As the son of a mixed race, 
Douglas recognized the irony of the presence of these offspring who made the enslavement institution unscriptural. For thousands, he writes, thousands are ushered into the world annually who, like myself, Douglas speaking, owe their existence to white fathers and those fathers most frequently their own masters. Douglas omitted the explicit language of rape and skillfully chose words appropriate for the public performance of his story in a 19th century context. He narrated a much more complex racial history than any pro-slavery proponent would attest. Certainly it was one that Josiah Priest preferred. The practicality of racial mixing common in Southern plantation life should easily, for Douglas, dismiss the ideology associated with the biblical land of myth in Genesis 9. Harriet Jacobs, another author, also used this common experience to respond to the simplistic racial categories surrounding the interpretation of the so-called biblical curse. Her question was less about the curse than about her theological conviction that God had created all humans from one blood, a clear allusion to Acts 17. This is her, these are her words. They seem to satisfy their consciences with the doctrine that God created the Africans to be slaves. What a libel upon the Heavenly Father who made of one blood all nations of men, and then who are Africans? Who can measure the amount of Anglo-Saxon blood coursing in the veins of American slaves? This biblical allusion confronted the U.S. reality of the crimes that regularly occur in addition to a slave. And Jacob's story, Incidents in the Life of the Slave Girl, the first one published by a female author, written by a female author, there were others that were dictated, this is the first one, the author, the female author, wrote it herself. Incidents in the life of a slave girl will detail the examples of the true nature of the blood that flowed the veins of many so-called Africans. Her critique specifically condemned the leaders of the white church. She writes, if a pastor has offspring by a woman not his wife, the church dismisses him. If she's a white woman, but if she's colored, it does not hinder his continuing to be their good shepherd. Finally, other African-American interpreters took a more critical approach to Genesis 9 altogether, concentrating attention on the specific content of the passage. Uh, Samuel Ringgold Ward concurred with the cultural assumption that Genesis provided insight into the racial divisions in the 19th century, yet he turned a critical gaze on the details of the passage itself. Kind of a lengthy passage, but I want, I want to give this fuller, I want to give Ward kind of his due here. In the sacred scriptures, he wrote, no mention is made of the son of Ham, which in any respect represents him as at all inferior to the sons of Shem and Japheth. I know that cursed be Canaan is sometimes quoted as if it came from the lips of God, although as Reverend H.W. Beecher says, and as the record reads, these are but the words of a newly awakened drunken man. I admit, of course, that the descendants of Canaan have since been the servants of servants, but I do deny that God is responsible for the words of Noah at that time. And I also deny that there is any sort of connection between his prediction and the enslavement of the Negro. Besides, how many other than Africans have been enslaved for estimate servants of service at the time of that prediction? And it's his, it's cool. Ford accepted the designation Sons of Ham as an identifying marker of African Americans, even as he argued for Ham's equality with his kid, Shem and Japheth. Throughout his narrative, Ford continued to use that label, race of Ham, as a satisfactory description of people of African descent. Acknowledgement of this biblical racial equivalent, however, did not transfer to an acceptance of Noah's curse. Following Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, Ward critically questioned the divine sanction of the curse, since it derived from a newly awakened drunken man. Plus, as he acknowledged, many other ethnic groups have been enslaved throughout world history, in addition to Africans. For Ward, Noah's curse was simply the scourge of a drunk, divorced from any divine sanction an exegetical decision Ward made based on a close reading of the biblical story. Despite these critical explanations of the Hamite curse, none of these African-American interpreters attempted to argue against this biblical myth as a source for explaining the origins of racial identity. Apparently, along with many of their white contemporaries, they accepted the blackness of Ham's and Canaan's skin color, despite the lack of exegetical evidence within the biblical narrative itself. They tacitly shared the larger cultural assumption that Genesis 9 provided a statement about origins. It would have been exceptional, according to Sylvester Johnson, for any African American to have questioned this basic assumption in the 19th century. 
Douglas and Jacobs did not concede, however, that Ham was an uncomplicated identification of contemporary African Americans. As Jacobs asserted using Acts 17, God has made of one blood all nations. Furthermore, Genesis 9 may support enslavement, but as Douglas and Samuel Ward argued, it did not support the enslavement of, of American blacks. For Douglas and Jacobs, Genesis did not support the enslavement of the types of, black, of blacks, racially speaking, who live in the United States. Their common experience attested otherwise. For Ward, nor Noah's curse had no divine authorization. These, these authors indicated that a complex color arrangement existed in the Americas that would not allow for the simplistic assertion that enslaved Africans in the Americas were black Hamlets. Instead, suggesting that they were an elaborate mixture that necessitated a more nuanced reading of Genesis, especially in relation to slavery. The authors of the narratives had to be careful since they were wrote primarily for the consumption of a northern white public. Many southern white interpreters, on the other hand, offered contrived theories of racial histories using various hermeneutical approaches to the Bible. As the decade of the 1850s in particular experienced the proliferation of such interpretations. During this, dec uh, this decade, legal historian Paul Fickleman concludes, the southern defense of slavery had reached its most mature and sophisticated by 1860, many in the North and most in the South believed that the Bible sanctioned slavery. Even if Northern white interpreters disapproved of the South's particular practice of the institution, many still believed that the Bible supported the idea of human bondage. These so-called moderates, including prominent biblical scholars, Moses Stewart and Charles Hodge, arguably the two most prominent biblical scholars in the 19th century, they believed, taught, and published that slavery was a biblical practice. Even while they advocated for a gradual, voluntary emancipation of the enslaved in the U.S., the institutional practice, with its specific abuses and dissolution of black families, they argued, was not representative of the biblical mandate. But for them, there was a biblical mandate. So despite Mark Knowles' claim that pro-slavery advocates had largely succeeded in winning the battle for the Bible, the most important battle of the century was not over the authority of the Bible. That was one theological crisis among many. Other wars were being fought that were more central to the humanization of the of people. The history and origin of the, of the division of races was one of these pivotal concerns, and the Bible was a weapon in these wars. So the decade leading up to the Civil War was a time of hermeneutical activity unlike any other decade of the 19th century. And some African Americans entered the public conversation on the complexities of race. For example, in a culture that privileged whiteness, it was not uncommon for black thinkers to defend the derivation of their intellectual gifts. Just one example from Douglas in his last, in his fourth, he wrote four narratives, four autobiographies, four freedom narratives. Uh, but in his last one, these are his reflections. There's no disguising the fact that the American people are much interested and mystified about the mere matter of color as connected with man. I have often been bluntly and sometimes very rudely asked of what color my mother was, of what color was my father, in what proportion does the blood of the various races mingle in my veins, especially how much white blood and how much black blood entered into my composition, whether I, I was not part Indian as well as African and Caucasian, whether I considered myself more African than Caucasian or the reverse, whether I derived my intelligence from my father or from my mother, from my white or from my black blood. Whether persons of mixed blood are as strong and healthy as persons of either of the races whose blood they inherit. I wish such reflections were not still part of our society today, uh, but I was asked a similar question about two weeks ago, so uh, oddly enough. Inherited Douglas's example was a prevailing conception of the superiority of whiteness. These views flooded the North American landscape, both south and north. Prior to the Civil War, President Lincoln himself could not imagine a country in which blacks and whites would live equally and peaceably together following emancipation, partly because of his own view of the superiority of the white race. These ideas influenced the number of tales created to promote the advantages of whiteness. The freedom narratives provide a number of examples of these tales and these stories that circulate among the, uh, among the enslaved. I'm just going to offer one example uh, this evening of these types of biblically sounding tales. In Henry Box Brown's 1851 of the appendix to his account, Brown wrote this tale that was circulating among some slaveholding whites. In this mythic account of origins, God created four people at the beginning of the world. 
that do blacks to serve the needs of their white counterparts. As a side note, without elucidation, this tale included a statement that blacks were created without souls. Now, this is an important side note because this was an argument that was going on among some people in the 19th century. So God's soulless human creation was an essential part of contention during this period. According to this story, this tale is being told, the black couple delivered sufficient service, but annoyed their masters by their constant presence. So the white couple prayed to God, because they had souls, they prayed to God, to arrange activities to keep their servants preoccupied. And this is how God answered their prayers. So now the tale continues. Immediately while they stood, a black cloud seemed to gather over their heads and to descend to the earth before them. While they gazed on these clouds, they saw them open. They saw the clouds open and two bags of different size dropped from them. They immediately ran to lay hold of the bags, and unfortunately for the black man, he being the strongest and the swiftest, he arrived first at them and laid hold of the bags. And the white man coming up afterwards got the smaller one. They then proceeded to untie their bags when, lo, oh, in the large one, there was a shovel and a hoe, and in the small one, a pen, ink, and paper. To write the declaration of the intention of the Almighty, they each proceeded to employ the instruments which God had sent them, and ever since, the colored race have had to labor with the shovel and the hoe, while the rich man works with the pen. What the white man discovered in his bag allowed him to write the declaration of the intention of the Almighty. That is, by implication, the words of sacred scripture themselves. In this oral tale, the white man assumed responsibility for the divine instructions all Christians had to obey. Support of the peculiar institution would, of course, proceed from this line of storytelling. <clears throat> Though Brown omitted any direct reproach, the subtle implications of a white-sponsored biblical text may have opened the way for a perceptive critique of the received text. Why should African Americans in particular read the intention of the Almighty if it was sifted through the interpretation of the rich man who used the pen and ink for his own benefit? There were others, such tales like this one, similar to the one Brown, Brown writes about, initiated by white slaveholders that provided glimpses into the oral tradition circulating among the enslaved. Members of the majority population developed these tales in order to maintain the hierarchical structures in society and the ideological arguments that supported the myths surrounding the ideas of whiteness. The leading contemporary scientific explanations reinforce these extra-biblical tales. Jo uh, Josiah Knott, a prominent white physician and well-respected racial theorist, propagated a view of the separate creation and distinct origins of the races. By the 1840s, as Thomas Peterson has shown, these ethnologists made belief in the innate inferiority of the black race scientifically respectable. Part of the conclusions from the American School of Ethnology, founded by George Glyde, who included the discovery that Egyptians were Caucasians, not Africans. That's part of a larger argument to remove Egyptians from Africa. Right? So largely overlooked was Glyde's argument that the ancient Canaanites were part of the Caucasian race. Oh, that's a problem. Due to this latter discovery, Glyde avoided the Bible and forcefully <coughs> argued against its usefulness in general. He was an early proponent of the advancing historical critical approaches to the biblical text. But Clyde was also ignored or challenged by white Southern Christians who defended the authority of the biblical account, despite the benefits of Clyde's racialized arguments, of course, with the exception of his conclusion of the Canaanites that were attached to Caucasian. By 1850, most American scientists endorsed the doctrine of polygenism, that is, the multiple creations, not just one, not the Genesis account. And the folklore and support of the superiority, superiority of whiteness received its scientific backing. Despite the direction of some of the leading white scientists of the day, many religious whites, including, including James Henley Thornwell, one of the South's most respected religious thinkers, held firm to the belief that all humans derived from the original biblical couple, despite the eventual curse of enslavement. The so-called scientific discoveries simply did not conform to the biblical truth, as Thornwell and his ill argued. Of course, this did not mean that these same whites believed in the equality of races in their day. But these white interpreters desired to uphold the integrity of the creation account of Genesis 1. The tradition surrounding the common ancestry in Genesis was one of the primary reasons, as religious historian Eddie Glaw has shown, for rare assertions of permanent inferiority before the 1830s. That's going to shift, though, by the 1850s when all this interpretive activity around the Bible starts to really pick up steam, leading 
following congressional fights over the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. The decade of the 1850s involved rising intense arguments surrounding slavery. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 is actually a restatement of a 1793 law uh, in, to, to get the whole country kind of on alarm so that anyone who may have escaped or may have been a fugitive uh, to the North can be returned by any citizen. So if you've seen 12 Years of Slaves, I'm in one of those narratives that kind of, this, that's before, he actually gets stolen away before 1850, and that kind of fits into that same narrative that's happening after 1850. Uh, most religious people in the U.S., though not all, believe that the Bible was of primary importance for defending the theological rationale for enslavement and that difference. Intimately related to this debate was the underlying racial ideology that surfaced this 1850 uh, law that's part. As diligent as white interpreters were about providing biblical support for the slaveocracy of the day, they were much less engaged in biblical interpretation for an analysis of race. As one scholar succinctly puts it, on slavery, exegetes stood for a common sense reading of the Bible. On race, exegetes forsook the Bible and relied on common sense. <laughs> this so-called common sense knowledge was supported by institution structures, economic, educational, maintain superiority of the white race. For many of them, the issue of race was settled by the biblical hand and the ensuing curse on his family. Despite little to no concentrated focus on a biblical perspective on race, if you will, by white exegetes, this gap was occasionally filled by black exegetes who frequently engaged the Bible with race at the forefront of their analyses. In 1855, Douglas reacted, shall we fling the Bible away as a pro-slavery book? And in that same quote, he's talking about the Constitution, the Constitution is we can't get rid of the kind of, he has a, a, a split with William Lloyd Garrison, one of the leading white abolition of the day, and who was sponsoring many of Douglas' public talks. And eventually they split over the Constitution. Douglas said, we have to hang on to the Constitution, we have to hang on to the Bible as a way of arguing, or we'll to lose the, the rhetorical power. Um, with respect to the Bible, Douglas himself was more interested in slavery than race. But in 1857, William Anderson proposed an alternative biblical narrative to account for the origins of race. Rather than attempting to offer an account for the curse of blackness, Anderson turned the question on its head. Whence whiteness? How did whiteness occur? I want to kind of transition to that now. The year was 1857. In this decade, following the congressional fights over the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, witnessed rising tensions leading up to the first shots of the Civil War. The Fugitive Slave Act in Nell, Urban painters, retired historian from Princeton. In her words, this turned the whole country into the enemy of black people. Even free African-American leaders in the North realized that their own status was tenuous at best, and their new legal status was in no essential sense different from that of slaves. It was a mass movement to go north to Canada. Many of these debates were religious in nature. Many people in the U.S., though not all, believed in the central role the Bible played in determining the theological rationale for enslavement, ethnic difference, and freedom. Any statement about racial origins was particularly important since the 1850s saw proliferation of such views among white advocates for Southern life and slavery. Anderson's title revealed his objectives clearly and directly. Bear with me, I want to read his whole title. This is his title. Life and Narrative of William J. Anderson, 24 years a slave, sold eight times, in jail 60 times, whipped 300 times, or the dark deeds of American slavery revealed contain scriptural views of the origin of the black and of the white. Also a simple and easy plan to abolish slavery in the United States, together with an account of the services of colored men in the Revolutionary War, day and date, and interesting facts. <laughs> the amount of words in the title was barely surpassed by the length of his narrative, which is only 57 pages. Born free, Anderson was kidnapped and sold off against his legal rights as a child in the 1820s. After detailing his personal story, Anderson tackled the significant trifecta in his appendices, freedom, the plan to abolish slavery, race, ethnic origins, and war, the contributions of colored men to the Revolutionary War. Uh, like many freedom narratives, though not all, the author emphasized that this account was written by himself. Unlike some of the narratives, there were no prefatory comments usually by white dignitaries, either to recommend the work, acknowledge the high caliber of the lead character of the story, or offer a statement about the relative value of such a project. But this independence allowed Anderson to carry out his objective of hindering, to do what he called free thinking. Of particular interest is his relative 
short analysis of the scriptural views of the origin of the black and the white man. Anderson ignored the widely held view that Ham was the father of the black race. Using Genesis 2-7, Anderson believed instead that originally all people were black, since the ground was white, black, or dark. In my own search through the antebellum narratives, Anderson was the only formerly enslaved writer who appropriated Genesis 2 in a discussion of racial origins. But he's not the first African American to do so. Since Anderson presupposed blackness as a default race of all original humanity, he proposed a theory of racial origins that addressed whiteness as the aberration. To support this idea, he turned his attention to 2 Kings 5, the story of Naaman's healing. In the biblical account, the Syrian captain Naaman has been inflicted with a skin disease. Hearing of the prophet Elisha's healing power, Naaman seeks him out, secures his healing, though at first he was reluctant to heed the uh, prophet's advice, and then he attempts to offer a payment. Elisha refuses payment. The biblical narrator then introduces Gehazi, Elisha's servant. Gehazi disagrees secretly with Elisha's refusal to benefit financially from this wealthy Syrian and opposing rival captain. So he tells, uh, so he tracks down Naaman without Elisha's permission. He tells Naaman a lie, secures goods and hides them. But Elisha is not to be fooled. He is a prophet after all. Elisha discovers Gehazi's deception and curses him with the same disease that Naaman once had. Not only was Gehazi punished, but his descendants would also carry this disease forever. And Gehazi, originally black in Anderson's account, Originally black, went out from Elisha's presence in the King James Version, which everybody's reading, a leper as white as snow. Really crucial for Anderson. Anderson classified Naaman's leprosy as a certain bad disease. Though central to the biblical account, Naaman's healing was of much less interest to Anderson than Gehazi's actions and eventual disease. In Anderson's retelling of the story, he ignored a few details. Most significantly, Anderson omitted the words men servants and maid servants from Elisha's list of items that one should not accept from others at that time, I presume during the war. Uh, Anderson kept his focus on race without complicating it with the issue of status. Many of his white counterparts in the 19th century recited this story, a very popular story in the 19th century, and Gehazi's sin in particular to enforce the status quo of the peculiar institution. Many early 19th century white biblical expositors, particularly between 1801 and 1850, where my notice is, avoided any racialized exegetical possibilities for Gehazi. In the King James Version, right, they, 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 they ignore this phrase, white as snow. So they concentrated instead their efforts on a number of other areas. I'll just list them out very briefly, particularly related to issues of piety and impiety. Gehazi's sin of greed, that's a big one. Or Gehazi's lie to cover up his greed or focused on Gehazi's sin as the outgrowth of Adam's sin, or Elijah's prophetic foresight, and therefore staying away from Gehazi's greed. Uh, finally, Elijah's frugality and disinterest in worldly goods. Those are things that uh, white interpreters are talking about. And surprisingly, William Anderson neglected to link Gehazi's greed with his newfound whiteness. Yet such a connection would seem relevant in light of the 19th century arguments surrounding the economic value of the peculiar institution. White pious interpreters exposed plenty of greed in the passage. Anderson discovered whiteness, or the curse of whiteness. Neither combined the two. Most interpreters avoided race. More attuned to status than race, antebellum white interpreters in the North and South utilized Gehazi's failure and condemnation as an example to teach servants in their midst to read their Bibles as in a widely popular tracts of the American Tract Society, widely popular which included this address, an address to persons in different stations of life on the duty of studying the Bible. This is how it reads. There you will find an account of pious servants. You will see how faithfully Abraham's servant obeyed his master, Genesis 24, how a servant maid was useful to Naaman, the captain of the king of Assyrian's army, and you will also see the punishment of a lying servant in Gehazi. Or we might find other examples, like the common arguments in the South in support uh, of enslavement by J.B. Thrasher, another popular pamphlet that was circulating called Slavery, a Divine Institution. Uh, Thrasher writes, also the prophet Elisha, on whom the mantle of Elijah fell, was a slaveholder, and punished his slave Gehazi by afflicting him with leprosy 
than just a few paragraphs later. So that we find God ever after entering into the covenant with Noah and his sons, constantly punishing sin in sinful nations, whether Jew or Gentile, with slavery, captivity, and death. Hence, we believe that the slavery of the Negro is of God, which we can trace back to the curse of Cain. While Thrasher linked implicitly the notion of coloration and slavery in 2 Kings, he completely ignored the ending of 2 Kings with its explicit reference to coloration and turned his attention to Genesis. Anderson, on the other hand, omitted the label of the disease as leprosy in order to concentrate on its coloration. Anderson referred to it simply as a disease, a disease of whiteness. As the King James Version states and Anderson reiterated, Gehazi departed from Elisha's presence, white as snow. Common sense interpretation of the Bible was the prevailing hermeneutical approach of the day. Common sense reading, the plain sense of the text. That's the way most 19th century, that's the way they read. If there ever was a common sense interpretation in the 19th century, this was it. Anderson's reading. For Anderson, Gehazi's curse is the biblical beginning of whiteness. Apparently, he had presented this exegesis in his words a thousand times in the hearing of the learned and had never been challenged to question. Even if exaggerating a bit the numbers of his hearers, what Anderson claimed about the decade was certainly true. We, we know this from multiple sources that, in his words, a great deal has been said about colors during the 1850s. The period provided heightened, intense debate over the origins of races, and interpreters mined the Bible as a central resource to help people discern how things came to be. Anderson shared what most people thought before 1860. We have to do the best we can writings that are left for our instruction. He correctly represented the decade of the 1850s, a great deal was said about colors, as arguments surrounding the origins of racial identification increased in the decade. The Bible, of course, was not excluded from such racialized interpretive discourse. One need only search the entrance, Ham, Shem, and Japheth in the popular Bible dictionaries of the day, and you will find all of the racial discussions surrounding those names. On the other hand, white interpreters rarely commented on Gehazi's miraculous alteration to white snow in a racialized manner. But it did occur, even though reluctantly, as the decades leading up to the Civil War mounted. One explicit exploration of coloration appeared in, uh, I'm just going to give just one example. This is uh, kind of an interesting one coming from a, a volume called The Illustrations of the Holy Scriptures. From one named Reverend George Bush, no relation to him, he was president. Reverend George Bush was, in 1839, professor of Hebrew and Oriental literature at New York City University. Prominent professor, right, when he's dead. In a reflection on the phrase, leper is white as snow, the author wrote the following about Indian culture. There are many children born white, though their parents are white and black. These are not lepers, but albinos, and are the same as the white Negroes of Africa. To see a man of that kind almost naked and walking among the natives has an unpleasant effect on the mind and leads a person to suspect that all has not been right. <laughs> Grant, I'm adding tone. I don't know how you don't add a tone. <laughs> the natives do not consider this a disease, but a birth produced by the sins of a form of birth. Unlike some of his contemporaries, Bush thought it logical to locate ancient biblical white lepers in contemporary settings, even as albinos in India or white Negroes in Africa. So that, that, that paragraph there surrounds the discussion of Gehazi. That, that's, that's his reflection of Gehazi. This racialized discourse magnifies what Edward Said described as the Western gaze on the Orient with this fierce and usually distorted description of the other. William Anderson had a different interpretive objective in mind. The Gehazi narrative provided a black countermint to the prevailing racialized tradition surrounding Noah's sons. Anderson's exegetical conclusion, leprosy equals whiteness, only became logical if the interpreter presumed the blackness of human beings, which is a creation. And whiteness, not blackness, as the product of sin. Anderson, of course, upheld such a vision position based on his reading of Genesis 2. Although he chose not to acknowledge any interpretive forerunners, Anderson did have forerunners, predecessors in the, uh, in the black interpretive tradition, though not directly in the freedom narratives of those narratives. In 1843, Robert Lewis, uh, in his book, Light and Truth from Ancient and Sacred History, advocated for God's original creation of black human beings, which he deduced to be Ethiopians. 
For Lewis, Adam, the Hebrew word, meant earthy, etymologically, and the earth was a dark substance. Following Genesis 2, Lewis concluded that Adam must have been black since the soil of Eden was very rich in black. What Lewis did not account for, unlike Anderson, was the origin of whiteness. It simply was not part of Lewis's objective, since his goal was to explore the greatness of ancient Ethiopia to counter contemporary claims to the, to the contrary, as he was attempting to do what Sylvester Johnson was talking about, his, his desire and need to create a black history. Anderson's independence from others, unlike other formerly enslaved authors, allowed him to stake an interpretive claim on the biblical narrative to explore the racial identities of the peoples who populated his United States. Apparently, he had no need for such financial and editorial support like other um, authors of narratives. He owned three farms and ran other successful businesses in Indiana and simply had the means to carry out his own literary project unencumbered by the political necessities of his formerly enslaved colleagues. In many ways, his appendix offered a rare glimpse into the biblical imagination of the black mind to account for the color of whiteness in, in the contemporary world. If a lot was said about color in his day, it was really what whites wrote and advocated about the origins of blackness as a way of organizing their social institutions in antebellum America. What was not widely available, partly because the institutions of politics, economics, religion, and media would not allow for it, was what African Americans thought, said, and wrote about the origins of whiteness. Anderson decided to explore the racial identities of his country's people groups and fill in an interpretive gap in black and primitive history. Of course, he did not go far enough. He offered no ideas about Native Americans or the small but growing pockets of Asian and Latino Americans who were part of this increasingly diverse landscape in the 1850s when the census starts to take note. The, la the later Douglas did provide a more global vision. But what Anderson recommended a theory of whiteness was sufficient to challenge the dominant myth of the day, that blackness was secondary, inferior, and later in the creative order. Furthermore, he accomplished this feat by using the primary religious source for Christian readers of his day, simply trying to do the best we can with the writings that are left for our instruction. Let me just take just a minute to summarize. No matter how we adjudicate the legitimacy of Anderson's racialized understanding of 2 Kings 5, his interpretation served as a potent critique of white interpretive tendencies. Why was it that white interpreters failed to see this narrative that concludes with the offender and his descendants being perpetually cursed to be white as snow, as an ideology of the white race? Clearly, 2 Kings has far more explicit content that can be considered racialized then does the curse of Ham account in Genesis 9, which never mentions skin color, and curses only the eponymous ancestor Canaan with no explicit statement of genealogical perpetuation. Yet the Genesis narrative supported the ideological basis of Southern enslavement and the subsequent denigration, denigration of African peoples from the 1820s until the 1960s. And the myth still holds sway in some congregations. The curse of Ham myth. I had a young African-American student just three years ago raised this in a class, and, and there were only two other people who had even heard of it. You know, we had a wonderful conversation about kind of the tradition. Um, this is recent, so still holds sway in some congregation. Anderson's argument is thus helpful, if only to shine a light on the deliberate inconsistencies of the hermeneutical traditions of the pro-slavery school, which readily chose texts to support their larger economic and political goals, but ignored others that could be perceived as detrimental to those in their social at Anderson's reading of 2 Kings 5 prevailed, the understanding of whiteness as a curse of Gehazi and his seed forever, brought about because of greed, might have served as a potent condemnation of a system that dehumanized darker peoples for the financial benefit of lighter peoples, and perhaps even fostered conversation about such economic exploitation. Suffice it to say that a significant hermeneutical opportunity offered by Anderson's distinctive interpretive move was missed, and white pro-slavery advocates were never forced to reconcile their interpretive biases with regard to Genesis with the text in 2 Kings, whose plain meaning should have challenged their assumptions about scripture's bases and what they thought as God's bases for racial divisions. These formerly enslaved individuals lifted up the pen to write and raised the voice to speak about an experience of enslavement that included a religious setting which the Bible was frequently interpreted to enforce and maintain their status and condition. And for the most part, 
They sifted through these theological perspectives to reclaim the Bible for themselves and placed it on the side of the oppressed. In light of the conditions of the day, this took an unimaginable ingenuity. They took a text used against them and made it their own, often reversing the implications of normative mainline interpretive traditions and the scientific community and the biblical scholars all around them. The ingenuity is beyond even my imagination. These public narratives left behind a legacy of their commitment, a snapshot of their lives, a challenge to the system of bondage, and a critical engagement with the sacred text of the Christian religious tradition that the dominant race, race marshaled to read against the marginalized and against the minoritized. Anderson's interpretive approach called for more than simply the right textual choice, since the Bible is a contested site. It placed at the forefront attention to identity in light of an ideological presupposition in which he took stock of the margins. That is, a hermeneutical approach that positioned the text and himself simultaneously on the side of the minoritized populations. This was Anderson's utilization of what we might call, since Dolores Williams, a hermeneutics of survival. And the best, I would say, of the black field. Identification with biblical people groups has been going on since the beginning. 
So in the early Christian period, the New Testament period, when they start to talk about these stories, uh, these followers of Jesus, what do they do when they read when they read the Hebrew scriptures? They identify with it, right? So this this idea, this has a longer history itself. Uh, I wouldn't classify that as plain reading, but they would classify that as plain. That, that fit into the category of plain hermeneutics. Uh, so the simple, the, the simple explain, uh, the simple interpretation of the text, plus this other piece, right? Plus this other piece that I can make. It can apply to me for, for whatever reason. Because I'm part of the people of God, that would be my difference. Because I'm part of the followers, because I'm part of ancient Israel, um, that kind of thing. So Charles Hodge uh, has this, um, one of his colleagues passes away in Princeton, and he writes an obituary. And in the obituary, he says, and this is in the 1850s, he says, uh, a true Israelite in whom there is no guile. His colleague's not an Israelite, there's actually no Jewish heritage whatsoever. But that would have been standard fare for the 18th century. That would be a, that would have been, he could take that same kind of reading and read, have a plain reading of the text. Well, fair. I want to examine a similar question to what Jim asked. The uh, question of chronology. <clears throat> Well, yeah. in the beginning, there was no Africa by name. 
Well, I'm sorry if the title was deceiving. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with 19th century interpretation. I know, I know, I mean, I mean Frank Snowden, right, classicist, was talking about some of this division between Egypt and Israel and the separation of that, but, but that's not where kind of my talk kind of goes. So, you know, and I'm familiar, but there are some biblical scholars, Cain Felder and others who have attempted to, to think more seriously. The Bible is basically, as I said, uh, it's, it's, uh, you're being centered. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the story. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But you can tell that story, I mean, again, following Cain Felder, you can tell that story, you can think about Jesus as an afro asian as in Israel, it's part of kind of North, yeah. North Egypt, North Africa. Right. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a different that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> sure. But still, I mean, you know, not not unrelated. So uh, there is a there is one slave narrative that's actually post-war. Uh, that's kind of an interesting story about the Black Mary uh, and trying to tap into some of that uh, tradition. It's, it's an early. It's an early. From what I can tell, it's an early story. Tapping into uh, Jesus and Mary is kind of black easy. I mean, she doesn't have that language, but she talks about the black Mary, and she's great too. Uh, that well, I appreciate, I appreciate your, your presentation. Very nice. Uh, I think I probably speak for a lot of people, but I am wondering if it's um, how easy it might be to for us to access some of these texts or narratives, uh, maybe even beginning with Googly, William Anderson, that would mm -hmm. get us started? Or yeah, that would do it. But also, uh, University of North Carolina, as, a, as far as I know, the best online collection of narratives. Uh, and so, uh, North American slave narratives, if you put that in, North American slave narratives, uh, UNC is really collated. They have nice summaries, not all. And they actually have a uh, also a theme page where you can, you can check uh, religious themes, for example, in some of those. Um, so uh, William Andrews, who uh, did some of his other, wrote a book in uh, '87 called *The Tell a Free Story*. He's a literary scholar who his early career was as uh, working on some of the narratives, some of the early African American narratives. But he he, he headed up that site, and he's, he's a Provost or something at UNC. Now he's got an administrative position. So, but he was he was fundamentally kind of getting that site off the ground. And so they were very careful to try to pull all the narratives together in one place. So there are a lot of narratives available there, as well as other uh, sources, secondary sources that helps that kind of in the time give context and culture to that, to that period. So, but William Anderson is is you can Wikipedia William Anderson now. So that's that's recently. Up, which is kind of interesting. But it really is just a summary. Um, Mary Prince writes the summary on the UNC. It's kind of a taking her summary and just expanding it. There's not much else. We, we, all, we all know how useful media can be, but it's a great place to get started with some of these names. Yeah. But they are all available online. That's one of the beautiful things. The narratives are all available online. Uh, what we don't have uh, at this point, like when you go to that thematic page about religious sources, <coughs> can't necessarily get, so you can get by right? and, and, and some of them will track through some of the narratives of life, so it's not an exhaustive list, uh, and they certainly don't have kind of specific biblical passages. I mean, this is, again, I think of my own interest, right? Uh, so those kind of resources are not available. Yeah, as, as uh, um, narrative writers and African American, Thinkers acting generally in the 1830s, 1840s, tried to wrestle with the origins of whiteness and most blackness and respond to uh, white misuse of the ham story to make it a story, a justification for certain How did uh, they all, did African Americans? also wrestle with explanations for the imposition of slavery on them. In other words, in a theological sense, how did they try to make sense of God allowing this to happen to them? Yeah, there's a lot of discourse about 
some of the narratives will have on their covers, now not many, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five percent, black men, uh, will have scripture verses. And it's not the point of this direction. James Pennington writes a narrative in 1849. He's actually, uh, he escaped from Maryland uh, in a very early period and ended up, when Douglas escapes, he marries to bring him Douglas to Anna Murray. Uh, James Pennington kept, kept his secret. Douglas doesn't know this for years, that Pennington had also escaped. But eventually, he, he writes his narrative, uh, narrative in 1849. He, he wrote a history book called The History of the Colored People in 1840. In 1849, he writes his narrative. He receives an honorary doctor from Heidelberg. Uh, he had to sit outside classrooms at Yale. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story. He says about this, God has absolutely nothing If so, give me another book. <laughs> that's, that's how he. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that all of them are there, uh, that everybody's kind of arguing that way. But there is this kind of weight. Uh, so one of the words you see uh, when you look at the narratives is providence. Right? Now one can understand providence as that's why we are in this condition. The providence of God. Never, never. You just don't see, that's why I'm in this condition. Nor is this a sense of escape from this condition viewed as a sin. That, the reason I say that is because you, you get this response uh, to that kind of idea. Uh, and so, uh, 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 Moses wrote, he writes a story in 1839, he talks about uh, how his uh, father had heard so many times the preaching of Paul. Paul, uh, slaves obey your masters, right? That's the dominant preaching. So, and it turned him away. But he held on to deist perspectives. He held on to a, a view of God. Right? Uh, but I myself, when I actually actually heard the preaching of that in from a black minister, and then he gives exposition what he hears in that. The final word is not slaves, but your masters. So there's a negotiation that's going on uh, that does, that's not, now, now having said that, I'm thinking specifically about the slave narratives, right? So I'm thinking specifically about this genre and the people represented by this genre. I'm not saying that there aren't African Americans who are thinking maybe we are in this condition because of, but the slave narratives do not represent that. So, and of course, that's a particular kind of genre, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's abolitionist literature. It's, it's functioning, generally speaking, many of the narratives are functioning in the North, in, among uh, white audiences to try to, to get the movement going, right? And, and whites, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, Louis Thabon, and others are sponsoring these narratives. You get told newspapers are picking them up to tell snippets of them. So they have their own political uh, agenda uh, as well. But never do you see that in those that I'm aware of. Someone would find something. I would be curious to you know. But Pennington's position, this idea that God is on the opposing side, seems to be the general weight of it. Theologically, you know. For him, he puts it in the place of the book. Well, he connects it directly to the book. So, you know. if I could follow up, did, did sure. you find anyone in the narratives that buys it in what's sometimes called the, the fortune of Paul? That we are in this simple condition because. Later. It's kind, of, it's kind of striking too because um, you know, take someone like um, Phyllis Wheatley, right, in her early, some of her early poetry, and she talks about the curse of Cain, right? So she goes back to Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and uh, so she seems to be getting somewhere near that idea, but in the narratives that she was not aware of, yeah. So. Yeah, this is a great observation, great question, right? This is one of the things that's 
That's, uh, this is what part of why Douglas writes his 1855 narrative. It's the 1845 narrative, William Lloyd Garrison writes the preface. It's basically sponsoring there. He's been sponsoring Douglas on this circuit. Right? And William Lloyd Garrison writes this, uh, the preface to this, and at the very end of his preface, the very last line, uh, no, no, no union with the slaveholders, right? which is also, uh, the masthead is also the top of the Liberator, the paper that Garrison produces. Eventually, a decade later, right, which is a little time, but a decade later, Douglas writes another narrative. This time, it's not William Lloyd Garrison writing the preface. James McCune Smith, who's an African-American physicist in New York City, very prominent physicist, writes the preface. And one of the things he talks about, just briefly, has kind of a throwaway line, about uh, the Garrisonians, right? Talking about the Garrison. That kind of, Douglas is going in a different direction. Uh, Douglas is going to write a little bit about it in the 1855 narrative. Uh, he's going to write a little more about it in the later narrative. So we, we, we start to see some. Now, we don't have the advantage of that every time. But you do get some of that. For example, the Henry Box Brown story that I told tonight is actually from the narrative that he wrote. There's an earlier narrative published three years ago. Two years, and this is 1840, uh, 51, that was 1849, two years earlier, by uh, a prominent white abolitionist by the name of Charles Stearns. And in Charles Stearns' narrative of Henry Box Brown, he doesn't tell that tale about the creation of four people, right? And they get in the big bag. And so Henry Box Brown, when he writes his own narrative and tells that tale, he wants to include that. So you, you start to see that. Sojourner Truth, there's a lot of discussion around Sojourner Truth's narrative. So Henry Truth couldn't write her own narrative, so she dictated it. And so uh, Olive Gilbert right, edits this narrative. There's a lot of discussion in, uh, among scholars about surely the things that we know about truths in some of her public speeches. She, she is a person that reflects on her body. She is a bodily speaker. Surely she's going to talk about sexuality in her book. Very little. So they. they Many scholars, uh, Mary Washington and some others, uh, Gene Fagan Yellen does the thing on uh, Harry Jacobs, one talks about this with truth as well, that there is an editor that is kind of controlling. Because in the 19th century, you just don't talk publicly about those things. Right? So, so we can see some, we can see the evidence of it in some places. So it, it's, it's clearly there uh, how much and to what detail, that's a little more difficult to determine all the time, because we don't always have kind of the second piece, right? We don't always have the same person writing another narrative now, uh, with a little bit more exposure, and a little more freedom. So, yeah. Yes. So, in, the, in this story, what is it that Ham does to be cursed again? He sees his, fa he sees his father's nakedness. That's so, it. Le there's a, a passage, Todd, you may have Sorry, Leviticus. There's a, there's a passage in Leviticus about a child seeing the nakedness of the father or the father's spouse. Or the, there's, a, there's there are several relatives that are mentioned. Um, the father was drunk and asleep. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the two brothers, right? Ham goes out and tells his brothers. I mean, if we were to read it, just kind of do a plain reading of it. It seems like Ham doesn't realize he did something too bad, but he might recognize he did something. And he goes out and says to his brothers, apparently, we don't know exactly what he says, that he must be naked, something, right? Because his brothers then back in, they walk in backwards with a cloth over their shoulders. So they don't want to look at their father's nakedness. And then they, they put this cloth over. But when Noah wakes, he curses Canaan, not Ham. So that's the part that's kind of interesting. Ham doesn't get cursed. Yeah. It's, it's, it's breaking some of the <laughs> I've had several students here from the introduction to the class, and today in class we did William. Ah, does William come up in the narrative at all? Did it do that? Yeah, this, this is interesting because you would think that that story would appear, right, with Onesimus. Maybe, you know, in the story, we don't really know how Onesimus gets to Paul. He's just, as Paul's writing back to uh, Philemon, some people say Philemon, uh, writing back, uh, he's Paul wants to send him back. We don't know how Onesimus gets to Paul. So there was a theory for a long time that there was a fugitive slave, right? He, was a fugitive, he had run away, and now Paul is sending him back. 
okay, is a fugitive slave, remember the fugitive slave law of 1850? And now Paul is sitting back. That story becomes very prominent in, uh, in, in white interpretive circles. Because Onesimus, we know, was a fugitive, and Paul is sending him back. It doesn't get picked up in black sources. It's kind of an interesting thing. So I'm not sure if they, I mean, there is one story, uh, take that back, there's, there's one story that Douglas tells, but it's the later, it's not the early 1845, 1855. He's actually over talking to Presbyterians over in uh, Scotland because money has been sent for missionary purposes to the Scottish church and, uh, and uh, from, from the south. Money has been sent from the south. And Douglas is speaking, right? He's, he's over there raising money uh, for that mission's causes. And he's speaking and he says, he, he raises the Philemon story. And he says, uh, he stays away from the idea of sending him back, except that at the end of that story, he keeps using, send back the money. And everybody starts saying, send back to so the story ends, but send back the money. So he must have said something about Paul sending him back, but he never interprets it. He never interprets it. That's the only reference to Philemon in, in the slave marriage tradition. So it's kind of an odd omission. Uh, but I think, I mean, my hunch is the weight of that story is better left unsaid. But, but there are positive readings of Paul, right? Slaves obey your masters is something that gets negotiated in the narrative. There are a lot of references to that. A lot of what, how should we hear these past, how should we hear these phrases? So one of the things, for example, it says in Ephesians, Ephesians 6, not only slaves obey your masters, Masters, be careful, because you do have a heavenly father, uh, heavenly master in heaven, right? A heavenly, uh, a heavenly master, so you should treat them. And then there's a, a, this is in Ephesians 6, and then Colossians 4 1, fair and just. So frequently, when uh, black interpreters talk about those passages, that phrase would come up. If I had only heard masters treat your. Solomon Northam tells this story in his narrative. We don't get that piece in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, the film when he's a slave, but he tells that one in his narrative. If only uh, we had heard treat your uh, slaves with, uh, with, with justice, perhaps the institution might have been better. Uh, so you get that kind of reading of Paul, and then you get this other reading of Paul, Paul as a co-sufferer. Paul suffered, traveled, and been whipped. So Paul understands us. That, that, you get that a lot. That shows up quite a bit. And if you love, the God of love. This is uh, Richard Allen, Bishop Allen's. Uh, he's reading Paul the love chapter. There's this thing about Paul the love chapter. He says, and if you love the God of love, you too will free your slaves. You know, so he does that kind of reading with Paul. Um, but I mean, not as much. So I was, I was actually, that was one of my surprises. Paul. Better, better uh, there'll be time to converse with him during the, during the session. But I would remind you for those um, who are interested, you can um, sign the sign up sheet here and give us your email address, and we'll be glad to uh, uh, include you in all further um, uh, in the future. But for now,